Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's pick up in verse 32. We're talking about the, the resurrection of Jesus. And they were put uh, also two other malefactors. Uh, that's not a good word. Kind of, they're such a malefactor, they'll be crucified too. Okay, so they, they, they weren't really cool guys. You know, they, they kind of messed around and done some things they shouldn't have done, obviously. And um, uh, led with him, he put to death. And when he came to the place, which is called Calvary, or some people uh, uh, translate Golgotha, uh, they were crucified. They crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding the rulers also with them, uh, deriding him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. He couldn't have, those were things he had to do. And dying and becoming our sin substitute was required in order for the church to be able to be established, or for him to be able to reconcile us to God. Okay? <clears throat> And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. That would be red wine vinegar. They let the, the, the wine become vinegar. And so it was, it was very big. Well, you, anybody drink vinegar just for the fun of it? Any kind of vinegar. Red wine vinegar, vinegar, apple cider vinegar. It's, it's good in barbecue, but it's not good to drink. You know, just like, anyway, hallelujah. And saying, If thou be the son of uh, the uh, king of the Jews, save thyself. And a subscription also was written over him in, in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, which hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. <clears throat> and the other answering rebuked him, saying, uh, Dost thou not fear God, see that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour. It would be about, about noon. They started counting the days around 6 a.m. So the sixth hour would be six hours from 6 a.m., which would be about noon. Hallelujah. And uh, over until the earth, until the ninth hour. So darkness was over the earth until the ninth hour, which would be about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So from 12 to 3, it was dark. Okay? A darkness covered the earth. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to why, but if you'll read the 53rd um, book chapter... Uh, the book of Isaiah, actually, uh, Isaiah chapter 52 down to the end, around 13 and 14, and then move into chapter 53 down through 5 to 6, uh, we get a depiction of Jesus on the cross. Um, one of the most accurate pictures you will ever see is The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie that was, uh, we, you couldn't understand how to read the subtitles. Because um, I believe it was, done, it was done in Latin or it was done, it was done in language, huh? Aramaic, okay, a language we couldn't understand, trying to be as, as close or whatever as to depicting the cross and the crucifixion. Um, but the actual flogging and crucifixion is probably the most accurate you will ever see. He actually, he was wearing leather about this thick on his back, and the, the, the uh, shards would come around and actually cut his stomach in a couple places where they wrapped around too far. And, um, but that, that is probably as accurate as you'll ever see. Some of these movies where you've got the little cowboy whip, and gets, you know, that, that's not even close. Uh, the Jewish form of flogging was tethers about this long, uh, numerous ones on the on the uh, whip with bone or rock or nail, glass, anything put in there that they drug it back across it would just rip the skin. And a Jewish flogging of 39 lashes would be about three soldiers taking turns from different angles. Okay? So, I mean, his back was just shredded open. He was beaten with the rods. His beard was plucked out. The thorns he put in was not your little rose bush thorn. They were about an inch long. Okay? And it wasn't your little 16 penny nail he put in his hand. It was a spike. It was like a railroad spike. And I put, I, I, I was uh, working with somebody one day and I was, I was using my nail gun and I, and I, and I caught the safety on, on the window. But the, the nail part was out past and I had my hand on the other side and I pulled the trigger and went, Sing! And I came back out like this, and I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that little thing hurt like crazy, you know, and this, it, was, it was like a four-inch nail, and, went, and, I, and I snatched it out, and it bled like crazy, but and I've done it, I've run finishing nails through my fingers and stuff like that, fine. Anyway, uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't that kind of nail, it was, a, it was like a railroad spike being crucified with Jesus. Jesus was probably crucified through the, the, the that, that time they considered the wrist part of the hand, the, the, the hand couldn't carry the weight. 
so it had, it had to be that right down here in the, this part of the world, then Steve. Um, but the depiction on the Passion of the Christ is probably as close as you'll ever see. If you want to, if you want to get a, a, a kind of an idea, I mean, some people got sick watching it because it was so uh, whatever. Now, at that point, all sin and all sickness came on Jesus on the cross. That's why it had to be dark. You couldn't have The Bible, you know, what, he's, he's, um, what kind of Isaiah 52? I'm, I'm going to try to quote a little bit. Let me, let's just run over Isaiah 52. I'm obviously not going where I went. So if you want to hear what I have to preach this morning over here, watch Winston's on the, on the, on the, on the internet. <laughs> It'll be out there later on this week. Um, verse 13 of Isaiah 52. Behold, my servant shall be prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled in very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage, his appearance, was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. In other words, they couldn't look on him. Look on him. The darkness had to come because they could not have borne what Jesus looked like at the cross. Now, with the, the whipping, with the flogging, with the beating, with the beard put that, with the thorns put in his head, that's all physical things that took place. But we do know that sin came on him. And we do know that all sickness came on him. Every sickness before his time, after his time, and during his time came on Jesus at the cross. Every sin, every man, every man ever committed came on Jesus at the cross. Now we know this, that, sickness, that sin will, will age you. It'll, do, it'll, it'll torment the body. I remember uh, about 10 years ago, 2020 was doing some kind of special. And they, they were uh, on drugs and stuff. And they, they found this prostitute and they were interviewing her. And I, and I'm, and I, I kind of flipped through the channel. I stopped because I was interested in what they were doing, uh, covering on the drugs. And this woman, I thought, my gosh, she's a 60 year old prostitute. This was, she, she looked at least 60. And when they interviewed, they asked her how old she was. She was 26. To see that the, the, the bear, the weight of sin in her body, just her, had aged her well beyond her years. Now imagine all sin of all mankind forever coming on one person at one time. Then imagine you see people who are sick, you see people who are, who are, who are, who are emaciated by a disease. And, and what it does to their body. It, it, it ages them, it wears them out, it, it, it uh, does things to their body um, that where it doesn't look, you almost don't look human anymore. All of that coming on Jesus. Why? Because He bore your sin, He bore your sickness, He bore your penalty so that you could live uh, free from the power and bondage of sin. Amen? Hallelujah. So Isaiah says, He was marred more than any man. Anybody say, any, any man. Amen. Nobody ever looked like what Jesus looked like at the cross. And in some of these movies where He's up there, you know, a couple of drops of blood coming down, you know, and he, 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 you know, you know that's, just, that's just not it. That's not what He looked like. You know, and, and I know Hollywood is doing, but you know, um, it's just not it's just not it. He paid a price for your redemption. He paid a great price for your redemption. Now let's think about that. Not only did he pay the price in his physical body, he paid it in his spirit. Okay? Because he paid the price so, so you could go to heaven in what the term we call is substitution. Go over back over to Isaiah, I mean not Isaiah, but um, Luke twenty three. And now I'm down in verse, what well, was I want to quit? Okay. 39 ish. Yep. Yep. We're, um, 44. There we go. In about six hours, and, and darkness is over all the earth until the night. I did all that because we're talking about it had to be dark because people couldn't look on Jesus during that period of time when all that was taking place. Um, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Now, if you read the other Gospels, you find out the veil was rent from top to bottom. Now, that veil was six inches thick of woven material. Uh, 40 foot high and 60 foot wide. You just don't go in there. I mean, I don't care if you're on Schwarzenegger on double steroids. You just don't rip the six inch material in half. You ever see anybody tear a phone book in half? You know, they'll, they'll work and they'll work and they'll work. And what they end up doing is they kind of get in a little corner somewhere and they get it going just a little bit. And it's not, that's, that's, that's paper. Take woven material that's six inches thick. 40 foot high. You just don't reach it. And it's just from top to bottom in the other Gospels. So the, the Holy Ghost came in and ripped it in half. Okay? Hallelujah. Glory to God. And, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having thus said thus, He gave up the ghost. Now remember, 
I'm going I'm to kind of run back between some Gospels here without reading them all. When they came, they, they were, got permission to go and kill the uh, um, uh, people on the cross because it was coming up on the Sabbath and they wanted to you know, make sure that Jesus was dead so they could get him off the cross before the Sabbath. Because they, they would have to leave him up there for a whole day if they hadn't. Okay? And when they came to him, he was already dead. Now, what they did normally do, they would break their legs to, to speed up death. And, then, and we, we can go into crucifixion. How horrible crucifixion. You asphyxiate. You, you begin to fix it. You begin to. You, you can't breathe because all the water is beginning to settle into your uh, the sac around your heart and that kind of thing. And you can't get your breath. You can't get your diaphragm up. So you, you suffocate in, in all the agony. You, you're sitting there. You can't even breathe. And you suffocate. Now when they came to Jesus, he, they didn't break his leg because he was already dead. But they put the spear in his side. And when they did, the Bible says water and blood came out. Now really, uh, that was a description. It was really the white corpuscles and the uh, red corpuscles. So what happened? Jesus' heart exploded inside the heart sac. And after a period of time, the white corpuscles and the red corpuscles will separate when somebody dies like that. And so when they poked the spear, uh, the, uh, the, the clear serum of the white corpuscles came out first, looked like water, and then the, blood, the red came out behind it. And so he said, you know, water and blood came out. So he was already dead. His heart had exploded from the, from the agony of bearing the sin, the sickness, and paying the price for man's sin. What a, what a great price. But, you know, for God so loved the world. Now, I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying not to go, but I'm going. Why did God have to send Jesus? Well, you see, man was created in the image of God. Let us create man in our image after our likeness, after our kind. Genesis, the first three chapters. Man was created a little lower than God. What is man that thou mind for him? Thou hast created him a little lower than... Then the King James Bible says angels, but that word angels comes from the Hebrew Elohim, which means majesty in the plurality of three or more. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Okay? And so, God, man was created in the, just a little lower than God. Man was God's under ruler. He committed high treason in the Garden of Eden and turned it all over to Satan. Satan became the God of this world. We read that over in the, uh, the church letters into the church at Corinth. You know, he's the God of this world. He blinded the minds of them. That they ex- that received, received the light and received the glorious gospel. Satan became the God of this world. Now, because man was created just a little lower than God, no one, there was no created being that could redeem man. The sacrifice had to be higher than the man. So God himself would have to pay the price. And so Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, had to come to redeem mankind, or mankind would be left in eternal damnation forever. There would be, there would be no redemption for him. It was God sent himself as the sacrifice. It had to be done that way. And he had to become sin for us. Second Corinthians five twenty one. He who knew no sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It took that sacrifice. <clears throat> and so we get a depiction of the cross from Isaiah fifty three. We get a depiction of the cross from the different gospels of what took place with Jesus, him becoming sin, him paying the price, all because John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, let's look over real quick and um, Verse 55 of, uh, of Luke 23. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after him and beheld the sepulchre and how his body was laid. They returned and prepared spices and ornaments and rested the Sabbath there according to the commandment. Now, by this time, the Jews had taken up the Egyptian method of embalming. The Egyptians would dip uh, strips of cloth in spices and uh, so forth and then wrap the, the body and basically mummify it. Okay, that, that, so they they had taken up that mummification process, and so and what would happen is as, as those spices the, the moisture dried out and it would harden like a cocoon. Okay, and so it says now the first day of week, week twenty four one, um, very early in the morning they came to the sepulchre. I did not stay at sunrise. Some of y'all get that later. That's why I don't have a sunrise service. He just said very early in the morning. And very early to me is about 9 or 10 o'clock. All right? I just, you know, I'll, we got to have a sunrise service. He didn't say sunrise. He said very early in the morning. Sometime in the morning. All right? Okay? You know, you got to have a sunrise service to be spiritual. No! I'm not very spiritual at sunrise. And I can't hold on. I'm like, you know? Now, now I say, well, well, you're not scriptural, Pastor. The Bible says it's early. I was speaking. He says, also, I'll start searching in the midnight hours. What are you doing at midnight? Mm-hmm. All right, so I got, I got so we, can, we can all have our place. I am nocturnal. 
And you got light by night. You know, I can, you know, I, I, get, I get to cook with gas about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, my wife can't cook with gas at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. She likes to cook at 5 and 6. And she's like her daddy. If you don't get up when she gets up, she'll make noise and stuff just to wake you up. Just <laughs> baby. Now, I'm going to do that to you. And I'm going to at 2 o'clock this morning. I'm going to do the same thing to you. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, they, and listen, and they found the stone which they rolled away from the sepulchre. They entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. They came, as they were much perplexed there about, beholding two men stood by them in shining garments, and they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. He said, Why seek you the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Hallelujah. And um, in verse 11, they went and told the apostles. Now these words uh, seemed to be in them idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter, ran down to the sepulcher, lied down, and beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering uh, to himself uh, uh, what was to come to pass. Now, uh, one, one says in that, and what the Jews would do, because they believed that the spirit left through the face. Amen. They went back when you died, your spirit, and after the third day, they believed your spirit. That's what they, they, you got to say, some things are, are done because of the tradition. Not because they were scripture, just because it was a tradition. They believed that the Spirit left through the mouth. And so they, they went, uh, they would embalm, but they would cut, leave the face open. Now, the, now the Egyptians didn't, the Egyptians cut the whole face, but the Jews left the place for your spirit to come out. That's what they believed was going to happen. Okay? And so they would lay a napkin over the face, so you, you, know, so you wouldn't inhibit the, the Spirit from coming out. Now, you know, you understand, the Spirit can get through the, the, the other stuff too. All right. As a matter of fact, what they, what they went down there and found was, and one of the gospels says the napkin folded off by itself. The cocoon was still there. Jesus just wasn't in it. All right. He came out. The cocoon couldn't keep him in. He got out of there. How did that happen? I don't know. God's God. There's just some stuff just going to go, God. Okay? I need a natural explanation. You're not going to get a natural explanation for everything in life. The new birth, there's no actual natural explanation to the new birth. There's no actual natural explanation to Jesus being raised from the dead. There's a lot of things you'll never see. That's why the just shall live by faith. It's all about a faith walk, and our faith is based on the crux of one, one event and one event only. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got, to, I've got to really get going there and then do that. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to put you in the back row and time out. All right. The, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the crux of Christianity. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Without the resurrection, there is no faith. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Without the resurrection, there is no future. You have to have the resurrection. It sets us apart from every other religion in the world because Jesus either rose from the dead or he did not. Your faith is either foolishness or it is reality. Okay? Paul said to the church, he said, if only in this life we have hope, we are among all men the most miserable. Why? Because you're believing a lie. Let me tell you something. Can I be real honest with you? If you don't believe in the resurrection party, live it up. Get the best you can get. If there's not going to be a resurrection, you may, like one guy said, you may as well party hardy right on into hell because, I mean, you're not going to have any more fun anywhere else. I'm serious. I mean, if you don't believe in the resurrection, go get you some Mad Dog 2020 and some Richard Wild Irish and get after it, baby. I mean, get your, I mean, get it and just go ahead. And there's just some people going, Pastor, I can't believe you just said that. If there is no resurrection, there is nothing for you after this. But the reality is, the resurrection took place. Yeah. Jesus is alive. Amen. There is not an afterlife, there is the continuation of life into the eternal realm when you leave this planet. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. He was raised up. He was, he was witnessed by, by hundreds of people. And, and Josephus, the Jew, Jewish historian, even records the resurrection of Jesus as being an event that was, that was talked about and, 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 and discussed and carried about. And he, wasn't, he wasn't a Jew who believed in it, he, he, but he recorded it. In his writings, Jesus 
appeared to them, was seen by many people. And then he told the people, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes, see here it is. Believe comes from the same root word in the Greek as faith. Believe is the action of faith. Faith is a noun, believe is a verb. Okay, and Pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, S-T-O, okay? These different words all come from the same root. And so we have believe. Believe is faith, is the action of faith. Okay? The just shall live by his faith. Jesus said, if you believe, if you believe, he said, you know, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth in his baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. See, you, you don't have to, you know, well, sir, I want to see him. No, 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 you, this is a faith act. This is a faith event. This is believing something because the Word of God spoke to you, the Holy Spirit convinced you of it, and you accepted it as truth and reality, and then you begin to live your life in accordance with that. The resurrection of Jesus. You know, let's go over here and let's look in, um, and i got to find it now because I don't know. I want to make sure my, my iPad is hooked up to a Apple-approved device next week. That's why it won't work. I, did, I plugged it into a cable that wasn't Apple, and it didn't charge. And they got little software things in there that say, no, that's not, that's not ours. We're not going to let you charge us. Because they went to $30 for the $3 cable. All right. My son in law it's found out. All right. Look at this. I can get them on Amazon. Colossians chapter 2. Hallelujah. Col- that's right after Philippians. Right before um, First Thessalonians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Um, you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh. Let me say something. Jesus did not come when you had everything together. Jesus is, you know, uh, some churches sit down and say, if you'll just stop doing such and such, God will save you. No, 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 no. Get saved and God, you can stop doing such and such. You can never get good enough to come to God. You just come like you are. Then when you get there, He makes you good enough. That's the wonderful thing about it. He demands you live a certain way, but then He says, look, come to me and I'll fix you so you can live the way I say do it. It's not, if you don't do it the way I said, you ain't going to get in. Now, I grew up in a classical Pentecostal church. Boy, I'll tell you what. You know, it's like they, women have jewelry on. Take the jewelry off and God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Too late. Done fill me with gold rings on and everything. Hallelujah. I've been speaking. One lady says, you know, came in. She's been filled with the Holy Ghost speaking 10 15 minutes. The deacon came in late. He was late to church. Deacons being late to church. They should be an example, not, not the other thing. Sat down and said, sister, but you take, that, uh, take them earrings off. God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Too late. You missed on the events. You've been filled. Hallelujah. Well, same thing. The truth is, you, you don't have to stop smoking, and you don't have to stop drinking. You don't have to stop shooting up. You don't have to stop running around with other women or other men. You don't have to stop all that stuff to come to God. You come to God, and you'll, you can stop doing all that stuff. He'll take you where you are and transform you through the new birth, and then, then, then you, you go and get fed the Word of God and grow in Him. He'll, he'll transform you to a, a, a creature, a being, who can walk with Him and be in His presence, cleansed from all unrighteousness and all sin. But you come like you are. Billy Graham has, has made it, it, you know, his whole ministry, uh, you know, the, the, the altar song is Just As I Am. You know, Just As I Am Without One Plea. You come to, you know, my Savior, I come to thee. We come like we are. Why? Because Jesus went through the cross and became what we were. This is what we call substitution. This is a doctrinal term, and it's called substitution. Jesus became what we were, so we could become what He is. Well, the right thing. Remember, Second Corinthians. Look at Second Corinthians real quick. Second Corinthians five twenty one. I quoted it earlier. Let's let's look at it. Second Corinthians, right after First Corinthians. Come on, guys. This is a really bad joke, but I was, you know. Trying to lighten the atmosphere up a little bit. Second Corinthians five twenty one. He has made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now the word righteousness is an old Elizabethan term, but it's also a legal term and a covenant term. And it, it carries the implication of being in right relationship or right position or standing with something. In our case, it is God. God brings us into right relationship or right standing with Him. The original Bill of Rights was really referred to as the Bill of Righteousness. And that changes the whole meaning. 
I got rights. How many, how many prisoners do you know are able to exercise their Second Amendment rights? Not a one. Because right. you don't have the right to bear arms if you're out of right, right relationship with the government. Hello? So it's really the Bill of Righteousness. When you're in right standing and right relationship with our government, you have, you're able to exercise these different things. Freedom of speech, you know, freedom of religion, uh, right to bear arms, right to bear and keep and bear arms. Hallelujah. You know? That a well-armed militia. Now, let me say, uh, my daughter posted, I was struggling to say, Jess, that's not really true. You know, someone shot somebody breaking into the house. That's why we need Second Amendment rights. Well, that's just a benefit of the Second Amendment rights. The Second Amendment was written to keep a centralized government from taking over. That's why it's there. It's only there. Its purpose was to prohibit and keep a centralized government from taking over everything and putting people under a totalitarian state. And that's why they, that's why they, that's why they, the, queen, the, the extreme nutbags want to keep taking the guns away because they want to take over and create a totalitarian state. Okay? Don't, don't think it's about your right to, to you know, shoot an intruder. You know, that, that just, just, that's, that's just known. That, that's understood. That's right. The, the, the Second Amendment is it was written for that. Now, when you violate the laws of the land and you're incarcerated, you no longer have the ability to keep or bear arms. Can you imagine the prisoners all going, well, I got the right to keep them on? I mean, talking about a zoo. And they make them anyway, but, you know, they, you know got no guns and stuff, all right? So righteousness means to be in right relationship with or right, have a right uh, relationship with, to be in right standing with. And so Jesus came who knew no sin, who's made sin. He became what we were. Alienated from God, out of relationship with God, we were, he was cast out from the presence of God, and he was judged for our sin. Why? That we might be brought into proper relationship with God. Bearing no sin, bearing no consequences for sin, free from the power of sin. Amen? That's why Jesus came. And he had, and he had to bear the penalty we were to bear. He bore our penalty. He was our substitute. Now, some of you remember, and I forgot who wrote it, but the, uh, the uh, old you know, literature book, some of you had to read it, some of you saw the movie when you were younger, uh, Tale of Two Cities. Who wrote that? You remember who wrote that? Dickens, Charles Dickens wrote Tale of Two Cities. And there were, there were two guys in love with the same woman. Now, one, you, know, you think, well, women do this all the time. She fell in love with the bad guy. You know? Yeah, sucker. All right. She fell in love with the bad guy. You know? And then he got caught, and he was going to be killed, and, you know, he executed for his crimes. They were going to hang him and so forth. But then the other guy was in love with her. And he wanted her to be happy. So in the, in, in the, uh, when they were taking the bad guy to be executed, he made a switch. And he went and paid the penalty for that man's sin. <laughs> Stick a coat in his mouth. <clears throat> See, he, he, he went and he was executed and paid the price for that man. So as far as the uh, society was concerned, as far as the government was concerned, as far as everybody else was concerned, that man had been executed for his crimes and there was no longer a penalty out there for those crimes. And the other guy was able to free from the consequences of his actions because someone took his place. Jesus came to be made sin for us and bear the consequence of our sin and pay the price for our sin so that we can live free from the consequences of our actions. Now, listen, you've got you to receive it. You've got to believe. Without the belief and without the acceptance, you don't get to identify. You have to identify. You have to identify with His resurrection. What does that mean? Does that mean you, now, the Celtic Cities is in a perfect parallel because the guy just probably kept doing what he was doing. He was a jerk. Okay? And she was dumb. What an idiot. All right. Dr. Phil would say it. There you go. All right. So, but the tale of the city, he paid the price. Jesus came from heaven. Ephesians chapter 2 says, even while we were dead in our sins, even when we were alienated from God, even while we were in rebellion to God, Jesus came and paid the price for your sin. He took the consequence of what you have done that is contrary to Him. 
that rebels against them. Jesus took your penalty, took it to the cross. Look at Colossians chapter 3 now. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Everything, and how many know when you go to court, they, they, pull out a, they pull out a doctor and they start reading what you did? I mean, even this is a speeding ticket, they got it in there. Nathan Taylor, dressed as SpongeBob SquarePants, ran a four way stop sign. <laughs> Cops sitting there going, <laughs> <laughs> writing him a ticket. A place over in James has got four stoplights and, uh, and, and he can literally hang down, blocking the sign. And he was on uh, one school, he was running late, so he, he took the back road, went through there, didn't see the stop sign, ran right through it, and next thing you know, there's a cop. And it's at the West End High School, their, their senior parade, they do parades every year for homecoming. And they, so they were, their class was not, but he was SpongeBob SquarePants. He was in a SpongeBob SquarePants, tights, square. He can do the noise real good. And the cop goes up to the window and looks in there, and there he is, SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to West because I'm driving a truck in the parade to pull, the, to pull one of the kind of homemade float things. And, uh, hey, where's Nathan? Hey, Mr. Taylor, how you doing? Where's Nathan? See you. All the kids kept disappearing. They come up to me, hey, Mr. Taylor, how you doing? Good, where's Nathan? Good to see you. And they're gone. <laughs> Because he had left 20 minutes before I did and still weren't there. He was getting, they, just, they just left. He gets to school, I know something's up. Hallelujah. Can you imagine him dressed as SpongeBob? Don't. It's a scary sight. But when you get a ticket, they, they write all that stuff down. It's all on there. You know, you violated this, you did that, you did this. You know, you did. You were, you were operating your motor vehicle at one mile per hour over, and uh, if you obey, don't obey the sign, you're going to pay the fine and all that kind of Remember that? That stuff came out last week. Obey the sign or pay the fine. One mile per hour over, they're going to write you up. Hallelujah. Well, they came out and said that's not really true. Now, everybody called the senator and the congressman, and they got heat. <laughs> this is what happened. Hallelujah. But Jesus took all those things that were against us. Everything written about you, everything written against you, everything written that to condemn you and to take you out of God's presence, he took all that and he nailed it to the cross and then he blotted it out with his blood. And if you will identify with him, it's wiped out. It's wiped out. It doesn't exist anymore. When you go to heaven, when you, get, when you get born again, when you receive Jesus as your Lord, when you get to heaven, God's not going to open the books and go, Dan O. Now, I know you receive Jesus, but I want to tell you, buddy, I remember what you did on such and such day. And as far as I'm concerned, that, 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 you may not get in because, no, nope, no, nope, it gets blotted out. I said, you know, anybody ever heard the term redacted? Okay. You know, they, they, when they hand out sensitive information, they redact all the names. And some people get a piece of you know, Congress gets a piece of paper and it's all black lines and, and, uh, and then all black lines. And then because of all black lines, you know, they don't get anything. Because it's all sensitive information, so they redact it from it. Yours has been redacted. It can't be found. It's not there anymore. Now, here is the beautiful thing. The Bible says that, that, that when the hills at the Lamb's Book of Life, everybody whose names are not blotted out. See, everybody gets in. Everybody's not with that. <laughs> you can't sit on the front row. Okay. What's this mean? See, when Jesus went to the cross, God put everybody's name in the book. But I'm not saying it doesn't matter your name is in the book. It's in there right now. Now, if you die without Jesus, it gets blotted out. I believe the, the agony of hell is going to be more, I didn't have to be here, than what's going on there. Because God loved you so much, He sent Jesus. Jesus became what you were so you could have right relationship and right position and right standing with God. He went ahead and by faith put your name in the book before you ever accepted it. And gives you every opportunity until you draw your last breath. If you draw your last breath without Jesus, then your name gets blotted out. But until then, it's in the book. 
What love. And even while we were dead, not trespassed and sin, He made us alive together and raised us up together with Jesus and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. God loves you so much that Jesus came. He came to be with you. You don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus bore it. You don't know how bad I've been. Jesus bore it. I can never change. He'll change you, not you. You can't change you anyway. If you could change you, Jesus would have had to come. You know, the Bible tells us that the, the law was given so to prove to us we couldn't... I'm going to paraphrase it now. But let me give you the essence of what it says. The law was given to prove to you you couldn't do it. Because it says if you, if you break one law, you've broken the whole law. And how many have walked more than a mile on a, on a Saturday before? All right. You're going to hell according to the law. Or you need repentance. Okay? There are over 3,000 ordinances in the Levitical law. If you break one of them, you're guilty of all of them. It was given to prove you couldn't get to God on your own. So Jesus came while you were in the place and in the state of not being able to get to God on your own. And He came and He said, Hey, look, you can't do it, but I can. So give me all your sin. Give me all the witnesses that are against you. Give me everything you've done to rebel against God. Give it to me. And I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to nail it to the cross. And then I'm going to go to hell, and I'm going to pay the price for your sin. God the Father is going to judge me, and then He's going to raise me from the dead. And when I come up from being raised from the dead, if you'll believe I've been raised up, what I nail to the cross no longer applies to you. It's been wiped out. What happens if I sin after I get saved? He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do we do? Forgive me. I, I, I shouldn't have done that. Forgive me, Father. But he's called sure. But he'll cleanse you from that. People say, oh, if you were a real Christian, you wouldn't have done that. I'm not a real Christian who have done that. But you repent, God forgives you anyway. Jesus didn't come and bear your sin and take it to the cross and do all things he went just because you messed up one time to send you back to hell. God loves you. Say, say this, say this. Say, God loves me so much that even when I was in rebellion toward him, Jesus came to make me a right relationship with him. It's that simple. You see, the resurrection is the key. Because Jesus paid the price, and then God the Father raised him from the dead, and now he lives to make intercession. And he needs to stay, stand in the gap for another. He prays for you all the time. The head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, the second person of the Godhead, the first, the last, the Alpha, the Omega, he who was and is and is to come, prays for you all the time. And when you mess up, even as a Christian, when you mess up, we have an advocate. Advocate is a lawyer term. We have one who argues our case. Many of you know, kind of understood if you go to the court system, in most cases, you need a lawyer. Because there's too much legalese out there. You know? You get a lawyer going to argue your case for you. Matter of fact, if you get a speeding ticket, every lawyer in town will send you a letter. For 50 to 75 bucks, we'll take care of this. You don't, you don't, even, you don't even have to go to court. What do they do? They go in there and they tell you you have improper equipment and the judge says, okay, and throws it out. If you pay a $238 fine, you pay the guy 50 bucks, and you never get points on your license. How do you know? Now, he had improper equipment while he was driving around his sponge bottle square pants. Just paid the lawyer. They went to the court. It was gone. So it was about $238. Actually, 288 because I had to pay a $50 lawyer fine. And he still ain't paid you back. You got to cut the grass this week. Good. Okay. Anyway, start getting it out of it somehow, some way. Five years later, four years later. No. Mm-hmm. No. You said you're still holding out against him. Forgive him. <laughs> Let the women be silent in the church. <laughs> That's a scripture. I'm just I'm messing on you, Melanie. Hallelujah. I'm messing on my buddy too. All right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesus 
Jesus paid the price. I'm not even listening to you. Jesus paid the price. So you didn't have to. I want to say one more thing in closing here. You can't be so bad, He can't save you. And you can't get so good, you can save yourself. It is the mercies of God and His plan that has made a provision for you to come into the kingdom of God. He identified with you. Now, your identification with Him is this. You confess His Lordship, you believe that God raised Him from the dead, and you'll be saved. It's that, it's, it's, it's just simple. You don't have to get rid of everything. What if I got tattoos and you don't have to go get rid of them? Hello? You don't. You can be saved with tattoos. You're not cap. Yeah? And some of them have got tattoos. And they're not strip biblical tattoos either. He was in the Navy. At Gitmo. So I'm figuring, I'm still trying to figure out how my daddy didn't get any. And my granddad didn't get tattoos. They were scared of the needles. That's why my dad hates the needles. That's what. He still hates the needles. He's 80 some years old. He still hates the needles. Hallelujah. God will save you with tattoos. Did you know that? Come on now. None of the things you've done prohibit you from being a candidate for his redemption. Why? Because he became your substitute. He bore everything you are, everything you've done. He's already borne it and paid the price for it. You can receive the benefit of the uh, cancellation of the penalty by identifying with Him in His resurrection. Amen. Father, we thank You for the Word. Thank You for the Holy Ghost. Thank You for Jesus. We now lean upon You. Thank You the Holy Spirit deals with the hearts of me. Thank you, the Holy Spirit, who moves and deals with people. And Father, I thank you that Jesus paid the price so we don't have to. We receive and accept that with glad hearts. If everybody would have an attitude of prayer, your heads bowed, eyes closed, please. I'm going to make an offer this morning. If you're here today and you've not received the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it's not a better day. The Bible says if you'll, um, today is the day of salvation, if you harden not your heart, as in their provocation, when they resisted me. We don't want to resist God. The mercies of God are great. The mercies of God are mighty. And God loves you just like you are, right where you are, right now. He paid the price. So if you're here today, and you do not have Jesus as your Lord, would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. Oh, yeah. Anybody here this morning that you're not born again, you don't have the worship of Jesus? Hallelujah. Mr. Pastor, or Brother Pastor, or Pastor Ed. I, I would say this sometimes, like, but I'm backslidden, and I've been out doing all the stuff I know I ain't supposed to be doing. The backslidden. You know what God said? He'll heal your backsliding. You hear this morning, you got back in your backsliding, you're going to get right with God. Will you, you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. I'm going to be doing a prayer to get you right back where you belong with God. And one more offer. The pastor Ed, I'm born again, love God with all my heart, but I'm not baptized in the Holy Ghost. What's the you yes. You feel with the Spirit and speak in tongues like we did in the book of Acts. Put your hands on and get your filled. Hallelujah. Anybody here? Okay. If you're here this morning, you should answer any of those. You didn't. Here's your opportunity. It's not your last opportunity. Well, you know, we, don't, we don't know. Life is what a vapor vanishes. We need to hate for you to leave here and not, and, and not take opportunity for this. If you, you know, we're here for you. Jesus loves you. And as much as, as any family member or anybody you know loves you, God loves you more. And he wants to bring you into his family. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.